without further ado, I'd like to welcome Anthony Woods. Anthony is the CTO and co-founder of Grafana Labs. He's going to share his views on all things observability, including where he sees the market going, open source, the rise of Prometheus, and what it's like to be a founder of a unicorn. So over to you, Anthony. Great. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, and, uh, you know, thanks thanks for giving me the opportunity to come here and talk today. It's, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's great to be able to be more involved in, uh, in the Australian um, you know, community. So uh, I'm looking forward to to this not being uh, just uh, the only time I get to talk to everyone. Um, so yeah, as mentioned, going to talk today, um, you know, around observability, um, you know, kind of looking at, you know, how we do things at Grafana Labs and kind of, you know, why we do things, um, you know, the way that we do and, and how that kind of fits in the, the overall ecosystem. Um, as mentioned, um, you know, head over to, um, you know, our Grafanacon website, um, you know, uh, put in your details for, for a chance to, to win one of our shirts. Um, you know, this will uh, you know, be a great way. And then, you know, this will kind of, you know, enable you to kind of keep up to date with, uh, with other events and things that are happening, um, you know, around Grafana Labs. We're, we're eagerly planning some more. I mean, we've had our Grafanacon conference earlier this year. Um, you know, we had our, an observability conference uh, last year, and we'll be having another conference, uh, I expect, uh, later this year as well. Um, you know, we're dreaming of the day we can do a, an in-person conference, but uh, it seems like we're still a fair way away from that. All right, so before I get started into observability, um, you know, a little bit of kind of background about me. Um, so obviously, I'm the, you know, one of the co-founders and the CTO of Grafana Labs. Um, but I started off my career, um, you know, working at Ironet, um, you know, here in Perth. Uh, I was fortunate to work with a, a great group of engineers, um, you know, and had opportunity to work across, you know, systems, networking and storage. And, you know, we used to do a lot of, you know, SRE style work, you know, long before, you know, that term was kind of um, pushed out, um, you know, building lots of automation, lots of tooling to support our infrastructure uh, and our applications. Uh, I then went and moved uh, to Singapore where I lived for, for eight years, and that's where I met um, Grafana Labs' current CEO and, and uh, my co-founder, Raj Dunn. Um, so we worked you know, primarily in managed Linux hosting, uh, and again, with a big focus around building automation and tooling, so lots of you know, automated um, provisioning of infrastructure, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, and supporting you know, hundreds and hundreds of customers. Um, and then in 2014, you know, together with Raj and um, Torkel Odegaard, um, who's the creator of the Grafana uh, open source project, you know, we founded Grafana Labs. So when we founded the company, um, you know, I was in Singapore, Raj was in New York and Torkel in Stockholm. Um, so from, from day one, we were a global, you know, company kind of distributed around the world. Um, and then shortly after starting, I, I moved back to Perth just to make sure that, you know, even if we tried, we couldn't be further apart um, uh, within the world. Um, you know, and being so distributed has its challenges, um, you know, but it also forced us, you know, from day one to function as a remote first company, you know, which, which has given us a lot of advantages as we kind of have scaled and, you know, given us access to talent around the world, you know, um, that we could can bring into the company. Um, and so I, I used to feel, um, you know, certainly over the last few years that, you know, being in Perth, you know, it's such an isolated city that was, uh, you know, a bit tough, but, uh, turns out over the last 18 months that, uh, being so isolated from the rest of the world has actually been a pretty good thing. Um, all right, so let's let's get into uh, to observability. So one of the first things I want to kind of bring up is you know observability is not the same thing as monitoring. So observability you know is really about you know building a system so that kind of the internal state uh, of the system can be understood based on its output. You know it's about making things that are predictable. So we're monitoring. You know it's really about um, you know, something that we do. Um, observability is an inherent property of system. So you'll often sometimes hear people say that monitoring is a verb and observability is a noun. And so why is, um, you know, observability so important? Now, Raj, our CEO, is a, a big aviation fan and a, and a pilot himself. So at Grafana Labs, you know, we, we often use aviation uh, analogies as we talk about observability, and we think there's quite a good fit there. And so this is uh, uh, John Boyd. <laughs> You know, he was a, a fighter pilot, um, you know, in the US, um, and you know, people used to call him Forty Second Boy because he had you know, a standing challenge that he could win a dogfight within forty seconds, even if he started from a position of disadvantage. He also created the you know observe, orient, decide, act loop, um, you know, which we think is really relevant to to SRE. So there's four stages in the loop, and the faster that you can go through it, um, you know, the greater the advantage that you have. And so, you know, the first step of, uh, of this loop is the observe, and it's, you know, really the foundation. And if you don't have good observability strategy, then you don't have a good foundation for success. 
And so with site reliability engineering, you, know, you need to be able to observe your systems so that you can understand you know, how they're working and identify areas that can be improved. And so this leads us to, you know, how do we make systems observable? And so this is where we have you know, our three pillars of observability. We have our metrics, logs, and traces. And so continuing with our aviation theme, uh, metrics are pretty simple. You know, they're usually single value numbers you know, that give us you know, an indication of one small part of the environment. They can be arranged over time into time series um, to help show trends and, and how things are changing, um, but they're intentionally very limited in scope. And so if you're flying a plane, you know, these are the gauges that you use all the time. You can quickly glance at them and, and understand the overall health, um, you know, of the environment very quickly, whether you're looking at you know, your altitude, you know, your, your speed, you know, how much fuel you've got left, et cetera. Logs are, are the next uh, pillar we have and, and really the oldest, um, you know, that have existed for a long time. Um, you know, so they were kind of added when, when administrators and, and programmers needed a way of, of sending extra data from their environment. They're intended to be human readable and, you know, as such, you know, they're free form and fairly verbose. So if you're flying an airplane, you can think of logs like a black box, lots of useful information to go through after a crash, but they're really too detailed to be able to glance at quickly in real time. And finally, we have traces. Well, this is where our aviation analogies fall down a bit, but traces are, are a kind of combination of pre-flight checks, um, you know, and looking at every circuit within a, a plane's control system. So tracing, you know, particularly in distributed tracing, you know, came about with the rise of microservices. Uh, it gives you the ability to kind of look through all of the service calls and invocations made through the life of a request in your system. Uh, it's similar to application performance monitoring, or APM, but you know, has a stronger focus on looking at distributed systems um, you know, rather than monoliths and understanding how a request you know, traverses through your, your, uh, your different components within that system. And so logs and metrics are pretty well understood at this point, but tracing uh, is the part of observability that, that you know, still is it's kind of in its infancy and, and, uh, and a little bit new for, for people. And so once we have kind of these, these data primitives, you know, we then see workflows that look something like this. You know, we, we see, you know, you, you have a monitoring system that will, you know, generate an alert for you. That'll take you to, you know, a dashboard where you might, you know, look at uh, some overview metrics and you might start drilling in a little bit uh, to, to get some more details, um, you know, around the specific environment. That might help you, you know, track down, you know, some systems logs that you should go and have a look at where you can start trying to find where the problem is. Uh, you, you might go and look at some, some traces as well. Uh, and then from there, you'll you know, hopefully understand what the problem is and be able to start uh, implementing a fix for it. And so what you can see here is we have a lot of kind of disparate data um, in a lot of different systems um, you know, within our, our kind of observability stack. And so bringing together this disparate data um, from, from these you know, disparate systems is, is where Grafana uh, really shines. And so at Grafana, you know, we, we have what we like to call a, a big tent philosophy. And so what that means is, you know, we, we like to be, you know, inclusive, right? And, and rather than asking our users to choose between us or them, um, you know, we prefer to work with other projects, you know, other um, products, other companies, vendors, uh, so that users have the flexibility to choose us and them in a way that, that kind of meets their specific needs. And so we kind of came about this, you know, strategy because you're never going to find, um, you know, that one tool that does everything that you need it to do. You know, there's there's plenty of, of vendors, uh, you know, in the market that they have that pitch around, you know, single pane view of, of your infrastructure. You just have to give them all of your data. And we just see that that's, that's impractical, you know, and if you are lucky enough to find that one system, you know, that works really well and supports all of your use cases today, you know, it won't be long before you, your environment changes and you suddenly have some new needs and, and new types of data that um, that's probably not going to be supported. And so Grafana Labs, you know, we wanted to take a, a different approach, um, you know, and allow users to get the most out of the data they have and also allow them to pick, you know, the right tool for the job. Um, and, you know, we do this by, you know, just being able to bring that data together no matter where it is, but still make it feel like more of a cohesive suite. And so what we, we have at Grafana, what we'd like to call is, uh, we call the composable observability platform. And so we start with Grafana and then we allow users to kind of bring in, you know, the the right, you know, backend, you know, data storage and, and metrics, logs and traces solutions that they have uh, and kind of mix and match and bring them together in, in whatever way works best for them. 
Um, so this gives you lots of flexibility. You know, it also helps you kind of support um, you know the, that transition of, of older technologies across to new technologies. There's always something new coming out, um, and so you know, rather than having to do big you know forklift upgrades and have to replace everything all at once, you can kind of just start using you know newer tools with you know newer projects uh, as you kind of phase out your older ones. So we got lots of feedback from you know, both the community and the customers that they you know they really like the composable model, but. Um, one of the things that you know they wanted more guidance on was which you know component should they choose, right? What's what was going to give them the the best outcome and the the you know uh, the the best you know observability stack that they could have. Um, and so this led us to uh, you know put together what we call that curated observability stack, which is really to kind of you know we've we've taken some of the open source as well as building out our own tools, you know that we really feel work really really well together and um, you know give. Uh, uses the the best uh, kind of embedded uh, you know, options available for for how they kind of build out an observability platform. Um, and so, really, what we wanted to kind of build was you know something that would work really well together and integrate really well together and give you that one plus one equals three um, you know, equation where you're getting more out of it than just the the uh, the sum of the individual components. Um, and so. You know, obviously, open source is really big at, at uh, Grafana Labs, and so you know you can, you can do this with all of our open source software. So whether it's our open source Grafana, uh, our open source projects with Loki and Tempo, and, and obviously the the open source Prometheus project, um, we also want to make it much easier for our users to kind of get started using. So you can use the same stack, um, you know, which is the the foundation of our Grafana Cloud platform, right? So it uses all the same technology. Um, we just host it and run it for you, so you get that same um, capabilities um, without the overheads of having to run it yourself. And then we also have our Grafana Enterprise stack, which you know builds on top of the open source, you know, to provide you know the enhanced security kind of uh, governance and compliance um, you know capabilities on top that um, you know some of our bigger enterprise customers really need if they want to run it uh, themselves in their own data center. Um, and so you can you know try this out obviously with open source and spin it up yourself. Um, but often the, the easiest way is to to spin it up on uh, Grafana Cloud. Um, you know, where we have a, a very generous kind of free tier where you can play around with it um, uh, and explore how all of the features work. But in addition to just having, you know, the kind of core, um, you know, uh, best of breed capabilities that we have in, with Grafana, you can still then extend it, um, you know, with additional ones. So, you know, we see very commonly, um, you know, environments don't have just one time series database. Um, so they they might have you know a primary one that most projects use, but there there'll be other you know teams that might have their own specific thing that they're using, um, you know, whether it's for their metrics, their logs, or their traces, and and you can support this um, you know within Grafana and just be able to bring them into the same ecosystem. <laughs> uh, and so I'll just touch on the question there around um, you know, surprise that we don't see Cortex in our in our stack. Um, so. It, that is what what our, what our stack is, um, uh, and I'll get to that uh, in a little bit. And so for us, you know, we really see Prometheus um, as being less of a the specific project itself or the the application itself, and and more around like that Prometheus ecosystem. All right. And so with the Grafana stack, what this, you know, kind of enables our users to do is, you know, we still have the same workflow, um, you know, going from our alerts to, to where our final fix is, but that workflow is all contained within Grafana itself. Users don't need to navigate between different applications um, as they are um, working towards a, a, a solution for a problem that they've encountered. Uh, and so users can, you know, they start with their alert, they can, you know, go to a Grafana dashboard, from there, they might drill down on a specific panel and switch over to the explore mode where they can kind of tweak um, you know, the query to kind of drill down to exactly what they want. From there, they can easily pivot to logs um, uh, and kind of get down to the, the logs that are related to that um, uh, application that they're looking at metrics for. Uh, and then from, from their log view, they can then quickly transfer over to traces uh, and understand exactly um, you know, how the entire request um, uh, was processed in the system. All right. So I'll just pause there, uh, and we just have a, a couple of polls, but I think they're already up and running. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, okay, great. All right. So 
this comes down to a question of like what makes you know a good observability stack or also you know why do we think our stack is better um and so you know there's a couple of different uh, key points you know that we think you know drive this right uh, and the first one for that is open source um you know open source is where innovation is happening um you know in the past you know we've seen enterprise companies you know avoided open source because of the perceived risk around it whereas now um, things have changed and, and those same companies, you know, see a, a need to, to bring open source technologies into their environment just to get them, give them access to this innovation um, and, you know, access to new modern technologies. You know, failure, you know, to adopt, you know, this new technology and these, uh, these new solutions, you know, just results in companies falling behind their competition and getting out innovated. And so we really see that, you know, that open source angle is really important. That's where, you know, all of the new cool technology is happening. It's where the innovation is happening. Um, it's where we, where you're getting access to new capabilities and new features. Um, and so being, you know, having open source in your environment doesn't mean you have to, you know, run it yourself and fix your own bugs, right? There's plenty of, um, you know, vendors out there that, you know, like ourselves can provide, you know, the, the benefits of open source, um, you know, with, commercially supported software on top, whether it's delivered as, um, you know, licensed software you run on-prem or delivered, uh, you know, as software as a service through a cloud offering. All right, so um, within open source, um, you know, we see things move really quickly. And to kind of highlight that, um, you know, we'll go back to kind of the beginning of, of where Grafana started. Um, so when Grafana was started by Torkel, um, you know, uh, he was a, a software engineer, you know, he was kind of scratching his own itch. Um, you know, he wanted something that, um, you know, was a better uh, UI for building dashboards and visualizations on top of Graphite. Um, and, you know, when he built it, um, you know, it became quite popular because, you know, unlike other uh, open source projects, it was had a real focus on the, the UI and usability and making it look pretty and making it easy to use, which you know, it was very uncommon for open source projects at the time. Um, but with the popularity um, you know, of Grafana, uh, as well as some new um, time series databases coming out, you know, we saw um, you know, a need to extend beyond just having Graphite. And so Grafana you know, added the support for having different data sources and, and being able to you know, bring in uh, data from different systems. And it's a really interesting fact is, you know, before starting Grafana itself, Torkel actually, you know, had opened, uh, you know, an issue on Kibana. And so Grafana itself started off as a fork of Kibana, um, you know, which is obviously the, the UI layer that's uh, now part of, a, you know, Elasticsearch. Um, but Torkel put in a proposal to, to add Graphite support to Kibana, um, but that was rejected. And so Torkel forked it and went and created the Grafana project. All right. And so... I think about three months after you know Grafana was forced, uh, first released, um, InfluxDB support was added, um, and then it wasn't long before many other data sources started to get added um, uh, as well. You know, depending on where the where the demand was, um, and one of those early ones was Prometheus. Um, and so at Grafana Labs, we're in a really fortunate position. Um, you know, where because we are so kind of agnostic to to where the data lives, and we support you know everything with our big tent philosophy. We've been able to be in a unique position to kind of you know have our finger on the pulse and understand you know how the the kind of you know ecosystem is evolving and, and what's popular and, and what people are using. Uh, and early on, you know, we were able to see the popularity um, you know of Prometheus and how fast it was a uh, its adoption was accelerating within the community. Now, a lot of this adoption um, you know has been driven uh, and accelerated um, through Kubernetes, where you know Prometheus you know Prosper Grafana is just the de facto standard uh, you know tool for for collecting your infrastructure and application metrics. They just by design, they work really well together. And a lot of that comes from, you know, the background of where they are, where, you know, Kubernetes is kind of the, the open source, you know, implementation of Google's, um, you know, Borg uh, infrastructure. Uh, and Prometheus is the open source implementation of Borgmon, which was their Google's internal monitoring system. So, you know, very early on, you know, we knew Prometheus was going to be, you know, the market leader uh, and, you know, was what everyone was kind of gravitating towards. And so we can see here, um, you know, within Grafana itself, um, you know, it has um, like kind of core home uh, anonymous metrics so we can understand, you know, what users are using. And, and one of those metrics is just understanding which data sources are, are, you know, really popular. And so we could see, you know, over time, this, you know, exponential kind of growth of, of Prometheus adoption. And, um, you know, it was just 
definitely outgrowing every other um, time series database that was in the space. All right, and let me just have a quick look at questions. All right, so a few ones I'll ask there. So one is asked around, um, you know, using New Relic um, uh, and, and being able to use Grafana with New Relic. Um, and so the answer is that, yes, you can definitely do that with, uh, with Grafana Enterprise. Um, uh, one of our enterprise um, uh, plugins um, supports New Relic. Actually, I think, yeah. Um, uh, and so you can, you can use Grafana as a front end for New Relic. All right. Uh, another question there is around what makes Grafana so key in Kubernetes environments. Uh, I think this is really around the Prometheus model. Um, yeah, so, you know, when Prometheus was first launched, uh, you know, it had its own kind of UI and, and visualization and, and a little bit of, didn't really have dashboarding a little bit, um, but they quickly moved to, to just using Grafana as the default um, default UI for visualizing data out of Prometheus. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, Prometheus works really well with, with, uh, within that Kubernetes environment, just because of, you know, the origins of where those projects came from. All right, I'll get to some of those other questions a little bit later. All right, so with the kind of explosion of Prometheus, um, uh, you know that we saw coming. We wanted to make sure we we could get ahead of that and and you know be able to support that that ecosystem and, and help it grow. So in March um, 2018, and this was actually at uh, AgroFinacon then, which I think was in Amsterdam at the time. Um, so we announced uh, the acquisition of a company called Causal, uh, and so. Causal was a, a Prometheus as a service provider, um, and it was founded by Tom Wilkie and David Kalschmidt. Uh, and so Tom was the co-creator of the Cortex project. Um, so this was mentioned a little bit earlier around um, uh, what Cortex is. And now Cortex is uh, it's a, currently a CNCF, so in the, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation project. Um, uh, and really, it was the kind of project that was built to you know, help address um, you know, some of the, the scalability uh, and uh, issues that were you know just inherent with you know prometheus and so prometheus you know is extremely powerful um uh, solution but but you know by design it doesn't support horizontal scalability or high availability um you know you just run a single process um, on a single machine scrape all your data um, it's really efficient at doing it um, but you can run into issues with long-term storage run into issues with you know high availability and with with horizontal scalability and especially in environments where you might have clusters you know geographically dispersed, um, you know, around the globe, um, you'll probably want to have a Prometheus locally within each cluster. Um, but then, you know, you run into this problem, how do you get that single pane view and kind of bring all that data together? And so this is where um, the Cortex project um, came about to kind of solve that problem. And so while Prometheus has that kind of scrape and service discovery capabilities that are great when running locally, um, it then, you know, one of the things that that got added was the ability for it to you know, remote write. So it's just kind of stream all of the data it's collecting to a, a remote destination. Um, uh, and so that feature was added specifically for Cortex. Um, and so Cortex is you know, designed to be horizontally scalable, you know, easy to run, easy to support, um, and um, cheap to run as well, and, and give you that uh, ability to have you know, all your data in one place so that you can um, you know, kind of build out you know, uh, better visualizations and, and understand exactly how your environment is working. Um, and so, um, you know, it also then has, you know, the long-term storage and, and multi-tenancy as well. Um, and so one of the things that we've, you know, done recently, um, you know, is kind of make the platform a lot easier to run and a lot simpler. Um, you know, basically the only dependency it has now is object storage. So you can kind of spin it up, um, it'll consume all your data and then just drop it into an S3 or GCS or Azure blob, um, you know, bucket and, and store your data there for, for long-term um, querying. Um, and so Cortex is the foundation of our Grafana cloud platform. Um, uh, and it's also um, you know, the foundation of, uh, of other uh, platforms as well. Um, so I think the, the forthcoming Promethe um, Amazon managed Prometheus service is also built using, uh, using Cortex. Uh, and as well as having it on the cloud, you know, we also have our, our enterprise version as well, um, which is where we really see the largest clusters of this, um, uh, you know, where we can provide those additional features. I think um, at our 
uh, recent um, Grafanicon, um, one of our customers, you know, was talking about their cluster. I think they were at uh, a billion active series, um, you know, that they were storing in their cluster. And I think they're, they're well, well above that now as well. So the next kind of key, um, you know, point, um, you know, that we see as being really valuable in, in an observability platform is about being efficient, right? Doing more um, with less. Uh, you know, this is certainly an approach we've taken um, at Grafana Labs where, you know, we, we've we always been a, a very, I guess, frugal kind of company where we want to kind of do do less with, uh, with the resources that we have and get more done, you know, and a lot of this is, you know, just kind of around our, our kind of open source philosophy and, and, you know, where we see that market going, but we also have, you know, that, that internally ourselves. So, you know, as we kind of build out solutions, um, you know, we're always looking ways to make them more efficient um, uh, and, and cheaper to operate and easier to run than, than what's already available, um, you know, and if they're not, then, you know, there's kind of no reason for us to go and build something new we'll just use whatever is, is available in the, in the space and so really where one of the, the great examples where this shines is um kind of with our, our loki our logging solution so we had you know pretty simple needs you know we just want to have our log files and we basically just need to grep through them when we're looking through problems um you know all of our applications are kind of instrumented with metrics, so we kind of have good understanding exactly, you know, high level how they're running. Um, and so, really, our use case for logs is when it comes to troubleshooting um, and you're know, trying to, uh, you know, identify the root cause of problems that we see in the environment. And so, you know, for that use case, you know, really, it's just going to be, you know, try and isolate to, you know, a small area of, of kind of logs that you want to look at, and then just start filtering um, what you want. Um, and so. You know, we didn't really feel that there was anything in the space that worked really well, uh, you know, for this model. And so that led us to kind of build out um, the, the Loki uh, project, um, which has been, you know, really successful. And we're seeing, you know, really great growth, you know, and, and adoption within the community. And so, it's, you know, it's built for, for developers by developers and, and it's you know, designed to be easy to operate and easy to run. Um, one of the big challenges we had ourselves internally was, you know, we'd looked at other open source, you know, options like the Elk stack, um, but they were just so difficult to keep them running and, and get them to scale to, to where we needed them to be. So, Loki is very simple uh, in its design. You know, you have your timestamp um, and you have a, a set of labels, right? And so these are the same style labels that you would use with Prometheus. Um, and then you just have your log message, right? Which could be JSON, it could be just text, you know, it doesn't really matter, we don't care, um, we'll just store it. And so one of the things that makes it really efficient is that we only index the, the timestamp and the labels uh, and and not, we don't worry about, you know, doing kind of full text indexing uh, on the log messages because we just don't need it. Um, and so you know, this really helps, you know, with that efficiency, it's very cheap to ingest this data um, and it keeps the, the volume of data store very low. So, you know, ingesting about 10 terabytes of, of log data, um, you know, results in an index that's only about 200 megabytes in size. And so you can think of the, the index that we create as more of kind of like a table of contents. You know, it'll help you kind of identify that page that you want to go to. Um, and then from there, we just kind of grep through what it is that we're looking for. And we found that, you know, on modern infrastructure, this is really fast and efficient to do. And so this gives us this very uh, kind of unique, uh, you know, approach to how we're using logs within our environment. And so we have this, um, you know, label filter, which is very much like, you know, PromQL, um, the very same kind of syntax. And there's also this, you know, certainly if you're running in Kubernetes, you have the same labels as well. So you have that kind of correlation. Um, and then from there, you just filter down what it is that you're looking for. Um, this makes it really powerful, um, you know, for, for solving problems and, and finding exactly what it is that you're looking for. Um, but in Loki 2.0, we kind of extended it um, as well, the query language where you can do a lot more. You can actually build visualization queries, you know, so get counts of, of uh, you know, how many log messages you're seeing, so how many errors over time. Um, you can also extract data from um, uh, from your log messages, right? So you know, rather than, than parsing all of your logs on ingestion time and having to index them, we just do the parsing at query time, which we find really efficient. So, um, you know, with Loki, you can, you can do this now and kind of, you know, uh, has kind of built in tools, you know, whether it's, you know, JSON formatting or log format, um, you know, you can kind of parse it and extract, uh, values out of your log messages or filter, you know, from what's in your log message and kind of build some nice visualizations. And so you can build some really powerful, um, you know, dashboards just from logs. So this is an example of, 
um, of what you could do. Now, this is just nginx logs um, and and using Loki to you know extract data uh, and build out visualizations based on purely just the logging data. All right, and so um, all right, I'll uh, I'll just quickly move on. Um, the other place where we really focused on efficiency in the same kind of model is with, with Tempo, which we announced um, a while ago, but I think went you know, uh, GA uh, a, a couple of months ago at our Grafana Con, um, online conference. Um, and so Tempo is our, our solution for tracing. Um, and so, you know, we obviously had, you know, we use traces internally. Um, you know, we've tried using, uh, we use Jaeger, um, but we found it very difficult to, to scale um, and it resulted in us having to you know turn the sampling down of our traces really low just so that we could you know keep the system running but this just led us to problems where you know when we would go looking for a trace um, it'd be very difficult to try and find um, you know an example trace you know for a specific issue that we were encountering because quite often they were just getting filtered out um, through the sampling and so what we really wanted is a, a tracing solution where we didn't have to sample where we could collect 100% of the traces that were being emitted. And so again, like with Loki, you know, the approach that we came for was one where we just don't index the data. So we just collect all the traces um, and we you know, compress them down into you know, really efficient storage blobs and put them in object storage. Uh, and then, you know, this, then, you know, the question is, well, if you, you're not indexing it, how do you go and find, um, you know, the trace that you're looking for? And so the answer for that is is around kind of correlation between um, different systems. So the easiest one is going from logs. So um, you know within our log messages, you know we make sure that each log message includes you know the trace ID from the trace that it's associated with. So once you've identified you know a specific error log message, you can quickly transfer you know transition over to a um, to a, a trace and see exactly how that trace is working. And then we also now you know uh, I think it's been added to Prometheus and we're working to to support it on our Grafana platform. Platform, um, we've added a new technology in Prometheus called exemplars. And so, what this does is, um, you know, for for something like a, like histogram uh, metrics, for each bucket um, that you're storing in a histogram, it will store a uh, a set of metadata for a sample um, uh, that has contributed to that histogram, right? So, if you've got, you know, uh, you know, kind of a long tail on your, your 99th percentile, and you see that those handful of requests that are taking, you know, ten times longer than every every other request then um, you know, Prometheus will gather an example um, uh, request right, that contributed to, to that tail latency and store all that metadata. And in, including in that metadata is the, the trace ID. Um, and so this leads me on to um, you know, the next kind of really important part around you know, what makes you know, a, a great observability stack is around you know, being able to correlate data. Um, so this correlation. So you've got your metrics, logs, and traces, but you know, how do you make sure that you know, there's correlation between them and you can understand, you know, how certain, you know, metrics kind of relate to logs and how that relates to traces. And so this, you know, is really powerful within Grafana and something that we've been working on over the last couple of years is, you know, supporting this use case and, and letting, um, you know, users really, you know, be able to get the most out of their system and, and you know, really support those kind of troubleshooting workflows. Um, so here with this, here with this example, um, you know, this is, Starting on the left here, we've got you know kind of log view where we've kind of filtered down, searched for our logs that we're looking for, um, and then from there we kind of expand and, and see you know all the details and there's you know a whole bunch of kind of extracted fields that we've pulled out, and one of those is uh, you know the trace ID, and so we've added this support to Grafana around this concept of past fields where when it sees uh, a record that looks like this, it'll be able to basically build a, a link for you to take you to a, another system or. or or internally into Grafana in this case. Um, and so you can use this both for, um, you know, support with, you know, Loki across to Tempo, but you can also use it with, um, you know, Elasticsearch um, transitioning across to Jaeger, for example. Uh, and you can also link to an external system if, if you wanted to as well. So this gives you that quick ability to transition from, you know, one view, uh, you know, one set of data uh, across to a different view and a different set of data. All right, let's just see if I can do a, a quick demo. But before that, I'll just have a quick look for questions. All right, so there's a question around, is there a point where, where structured logs just end up being um, a, a metric? And what's the difference when we take structured uh, logging to the extreme? So I think 
For us, logging we really see as being um, like events that are happening in an environment, whereas metrics are more about trends that you're seeing in environment accounts. And so with certainly with Loki itself and, and with Promptow, which is the kind of agent for collecting the logs and, and you know pushing them up, um, you know, we've built in that that capability of being able to uh, build metrics out of the logs as you're as you're kind of receiving them. So like counts of errors, um, you know, you can count the number of times you see a, a panic, you know, for example, and kind of record that as a metric and emit it at the same time. Because um, we do see, you know, that makes it a lot more efficient to query if you if you do that. So if you've got certain kind of queries that you run regularly to kind of build insights out of your metrics, so to kind of turn logs into uh, into metrics, um, it's always going to be more efficient if you just pre-compute that as you go rather than trying to do it at query time. But we definitely see them um, being separate. I mean, you can kind of combine the two, right? So like using something like Promptail, you know, um, you know, avoid you having to instrument your application, um, but you're always going to get a much better result if you do just in instrument your application. So using logs to generate metrics um, is something that's quite popular with more legacy applications where you don't want to have to go oh, and invest in updating them and, and adding in some instrumentation libraries and you just want to leverage the fact that there's already logs there and you can extract values out um, and um, push them up as metrics. You know, there's lots of, you know, older applications that, you know, periodically emit, you know, performance counters and performance metrics in their logs. Um, and so you can use um, Promptail or even FluentD or, or other tools to kind of extract that data and turn it into metrics and, and push it up to your system. All right. Um, okay. So another question here, just to back around kind of metrics around the relationship between Cortex and Thanos. Uh, and do we see the projects merging at any point? Um, possibly. Uh, so there's definitely a lot of collaboration between the two. Um, um, we work very closely with the, the Thanos team. Um, uh, there's a lot of shared code between Cortex and Thanos, um, uh, and that's kind of continuing. And, and, you know, really we've, you know, both kind of work together. So, you know, we've taken some of the best bits of, of Thanos um, and added them to Cortex and they've taken some of the best bits of Cortex and added it to, to Thanos. And so, you know, we are seeing things, um, you know, kind of merge a little bit, but they are still a little bit different in, in how they go about solving the problem and, you know, have certain trade-offs. Um, there's actually a really good um, presentation, I think from maybe from KubeCon last year, late last year, um, where it was both Tom um, and, um, Oh, his name uh, leaves me with the maintainer of uh, of Thanos. Um, the two of them did a, a a joint presentation where they kind of went through the the kind of strengths uh, and weaknesses of, of Cortex and Thanos, and like just had a very balanced uh, view of of why they do things a little bit differently and and why that works. Because um, you know there are some trade offs for for each one um, depending on you know the environment that you're working in. So both of them are CNCF projects. Um, so we'll, we'll see how they kind of, you know, progress and change over time. Uh, last question there is around, you know, what's more popular choice for, for scraping um, uh, with Grafana, Prometheus or InfluxDB? Um, Prometheus by far. All right, uh, all right. Let me see if I can quickly do a quick little demo. Have you been paying homage to the demo gods, Anthony? <laughs> Those never work when you need them to. All right. <laughs> All right. Let me just uh, see if I can bring that up in another tab. All right. Can everybody see that? Yeah, we can see it. Yep, okay, sure. All right, so this is just a, a quick little demo application we have. It's got kind of three tiers to it, uh, kind of like a load balancer, which is also, I think, generating load for it, you know, a front end app and a, and a back end component. We can see here, it's kind of regularly erroring. And so this is kind of the workflow, you know, that we really see with Grafana. Um, you know, when you get an alert, you'll jump in the dashboard and have a look. And so one of the things you can see here is, um, you know, I mentioned early exemplars. And so this is an example of that where, you know, for each of these um, time buckets, you can see 
um, you know, a, a sample metric that contributed, um, you know, to that number. Um, so if we've got you know, an outline here, we can quickly have a look and see, um, you know, exactly what, where that went. So this is still a work in progress, but you know, what you'll be able to do is then click on that trace and go directly to, um, to the trace view. But with this view here, um, you know, you might see that you've got an error. So you might kind of drill down, have a look, um, you know, see what's going on from here. You can quickly pivot across to our explore mode. Um, you know, which will kind of bring up your query where you can kind of, you know, tweak it and tune it a little bit and see what you're looking at um, and get a little bit kind of more insight and kind of drill down to, you know, specific metric that you want. You might kind of tweak the, the query parameters here a little bit. And then from there, you can quickly um, transition across to a log view. And you'll notice when you do that, the uh, the, the uh, label filter is, is brought across for you because, you know, we understand that you know, when using, you know, Prometheus and Loki, the label sets are, are the same. Um, so this is giving us the same log view, um, uh, same set of logs for the metrics that we were looking at. And so here we can kind of query down to exactly what we're looking for. 100, let's look for 500 errors, um, run that. And then we can see, oh great, here's all my errors. So I can expand that. I can see I've got a trace ID and I can quickly just bring it up and dive in and have a look at the full trace for that and see exactly, you know, how the request was processed within my system um, and, you know, start drilling into what might have gone wrong with that. All right. That's about two weeks worth of debugging in about two seconds there. You're just showing yeah. off, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It's, and it's a, it's amazing how powerful it is. I mean, this is a, a kind of a, a curated, you know, uh, demo, you know, environment where it's made to look easy, but it's just as easy in a, in a real environment. So for our own internal systems, when we're doing this, it's just as easy to do this where we, you know, we can start our metrics, look at things, drill down to logs, and then quickly just jump across to, to traces. And one of the things that really, um, you know, supports this is certainly with Tempo is the fact that we have 100% sampling of our traces. We don't have to compromise and uh, and and sample things. Um, so we know that for every log message, you know, if there's a trace ID in it, we have that trace. Um, and because we're just looking it up by ID all the time, it's really efficient to query. Cool. All right. And so the last uh, the last kind of big piece for us around you know building out you know a, a modern observability stack is ensuring that it's extensible. Um, you know, we see this change happening, you know, in the environment constantly. Um, there's new technologies coming out, um, you know, new tools to use, um, new features. And, you know, there's there's new use cases that are coming up all the time. And it's really important for, um, you know, for an observability stack to, to be extensible. And so this is, you know, one of the, the driving reasons why in Grafana we, we built out this kind of plug-in ecosystem, you know, to support um, use cases beyond our own, um, right? We're very good at kind of solving I mean, our own problems. You know, it makes it very easy as a as a company building a product when you're building a product that you know you're using yourself, and and we do that a lot. You know, for all of our products, you know, we always dog food what we're doing. Um, but there's lots of kind of use cases, you know, outside of what we have visibility in, and so the the kind of plugin ecosystem really supports this and, and gives people the ability to, to build, um, you know, extensions into Grafana to give them access to data sets, um, you know, they're in, inside their environment. And so today we have, you know, as you can see, like, you know, 220 plus, you know, different, um, you know, plugins that give you access to whether it's different visualization modes or different data sources that you could go and use, or sometimes maybe be for applications that give you the ability to interact with your data as well. So we find this is, you know, kind of really powerful with Grafana itself and, and something that we're kind of investing more in and building more out to one, you know, build more capabilities and, and new things, um, as well as make it much easier for users to go and build their own, uh, their own plugins and kind of extend Grafana to, to adopt it to their own use cases. Um, and so, you know, we want to make sure that we can kind of keep supporting this and this fits, you know, with our, both our open source as well as, you know, with our big tent philosophy where, you know, we really want to make sure we can, you know, keep uh, users, you know, getting the best out of the, the technology that they already have and, and being able to use Grafana to bring together their data in different places. And extensibility also goes beyond just kind of extending, you know, what you can do with the data that you have. And, and also, you know, for observability, what we think is important and where we see things going is, you know, extensibility is also about, you know, extending what you observe, right? So, 
you know, as site reliability engineers, you know, we really focus on our infrastructure and our applications. But now we're also, you know, building out tools and capabilities to allow you to observe, you know, other systems, um, you know, within your organization, whether it's, you know, understanding your, your software development lifecycle and being able to track, um, you know, within Grafana, like, you know, team velocity and, um, you know, then the other side support and understanding, you know, how many support tickets are open and, and being created for an application. So you can kind of get that observability on, you know, what's happening before your applications get deployed and, and then also what's happening after they get deployed with, you know, your customer support feedback. And then beyond that now, you know, we're also seeing more and more trends of users bringing in, you know, more kind of um, BI data, so the kind of business insights and, you know, understanding exactly, you know, how things are, are impacting their environment. Um, one of the great things, um, you know, with Grafana and, and even from early on and, um, you know, that was really powerful and really popular and, and we see a lot is people being able to bring in, um, you know, a lot of their kind of sales and kind of finance data that they have so they can understand when they do have an outage, you know, exactly how that impacts their revenue. Um, so there's nothing better than having a nice big, you know, Grafana dashboard that, you know, showing you the the amount of lost revenue you have, you know, because you had that one hour outage, right? And being able to make it really clear to the organization why it's so important to invest in in site reliability uh, and improving your application because it, you know it does have you know a positive benefit. All right, and that's that's all I have. So let me just have a quick scan over questions, and if anyone has any more, throw them in. All right. All right. I think <laughs> so some specific ones will I'll kind of follow up uh, afterwards uh, where I can go and pull up data. Um, uh, anything that's asking about specific things like dashboards or uh, anything else. But uh, if there's uh, if there's no more any questions, I'd just like to, to thank everyone for uh, for your time today. And I, and I hope this was a uh, was a useful set of information. Um, and uh, and don't forget to uh, to yeah, give us your details so you can win that uh, that T-shirt. I've got a quickie question for you, um, Anthony. Great. Shoot. Uh, hy hypothetically speaking, if I was crazy enough to want to start to offer K Kubernetes as a service, um, it would always be very nice if we can get some logging in there as well. And if I was to chuck the, the premise that it could be an air-gapped environment in there, would that take away the fun? Or are we do do we still have a full tool bag to be able to do some wonderful stuff? Yeah. So one of the great things, um, uh, certainly about the stack that we have, and, and we do this ourselves, is we just deploy it into the Kubernetes cluster itself, um, which can be tricky, obviously, because when your Kubernetes cluster fails, you then don't have access to your observability data to know why it's yeah. failed. Um, yeah. But there's that trade-off, right? Um, you know, like you know, if you can't, you know, have the data streaming out, then then it gets more difficult. But um, you know, it's certainly possible to to spin all of this up within within the one cluster. Um, and you know, we do this uh, ourselves. You know, certainly with with our development clusters, you know, those kind of things. And with all the tooling that we have, you know, whether it's you know Prometheus or uh, you know Promtail, the agents is, you know, we often send to multiple destinations. Um, you know, so we might send, um, you know, all of the metrics to both our, you know, our centralized kind of, you know, uh, you know, kind of operations, you know, cluster that we have that's kind of dedicated for that, as well as to a, a dev cluster, for example. Um, so we've got kind of two copies of the data. Um, uh, and you can do that with your logs and, and traces as well, where you can send copies to, to two different systems. Um, but yeah, if, if you're building out something that's, you know, you want to have running air gap, you can run it um, all together. We've definitely seen this use case uh, kind of happen and come up a lot with, with our customers where they're looking for, you know, kind of that edge uh, kind of computing um, scenario where, you know, they go and deploy a whole bunch of, you know, small machines into, a, you know, whether it's a, a store or, a, you know, a restaurant or something like that, where they've got a, a small little Kubernetes cluster running and they want to run this stack on top of it. Yep. Cool. Just in case people are not aware, um, air gap is a term that you'd generally be used uh, where you're working in a, high, a higher security environment, perhaps sometimes. So, you know, some of the, you know, the military and government, you know, they work behind uh, multiple layers of networking. So sometimes it's relevant to be able to work inside that environment, as in there's no calls going out to the interwebs. Yeah, we're actually seeing this, uh, um, quite, like certainly Loki, I think we're seeing be quite popular for this use case. Um, because one of the things for the, the air-gapped environment, especially in you know, military environments is 
they don't have a lot of space, right? So they're constrained on the resources they have. And so, you know, with the efficiency that Loki has with being able to store data, um, you know, we're seeing um, quite a lot of interest in, in, in that for, for that use case. Cool. Do we have any other, any other questions? Tom, Dylan, or Scott? I do, but mine's quite trivial and I'm kind of scared to ask it, to be honest. Um, What's the reasoning behind the names? Obviously, Thanos, Loki, all very popular names from like demigods and whatnot. Um, the reasoning is that we let engineers pick names. <laughs> <laughs> I like I think engineers. <laughs> um, I think it's really, I mean, there's... Um, there's, you know, the, the old saying, right? There's, there's two hard problems in, uh, in computer science: um, uh, cache invalidation, um, picking names, and off by one um, uh, errors. So, um, uh, so I mean, they're a hard problem uh, we, that, that we run into. But I, I don't think there's any uh, name for it. One of the interesting things we have with you know, certainly our projects, um, uh, you know, is that we just pick. Really, we just pick something that that likes and often it starts off as um like an internal project name um right and we're like oh this will just do for now but we'll we'll change the name later um and then we never do and, and that just is what gets uh, gets used as a name because it just you know gets momentum and, and that's what we know it as so we keep using it oh, nice uh anyone else got any other questions so I, I see one around you know are there any preferred alerting on call solutions that work well with grafana alerts um I mean, there's a lot, um, you know, so um, both Grafana, I mean, uh, whether you're using Alert Manager and, and or Grafana for your alerting, and, and there's also you know, now in Grafana 8, um, there's the new, what we call unified alerting, which is bringing in new capabilities of Alert Manager and bringing that into Grafana itself. It can obviously integrate with you know, a number of different, um, you know, on-call solutions, whether it's PagerDuty um, or... Um, uh, uh, what are the other ones? Uh, uh, Opsgenie, uh, there's a few others. So they're all supported within Grafana itself for, for how you can um, uh, extend that. And, you know, and this is also kind of an area that we're, we're looking at ourselves for, for how we can just improve that um, uh, you know, for, the, for the community. Perfect. Well, Anthony, like, thank you so much for, for taking your time to kind of well, go through what is no doubt one of the, if not one of the most popular tools definitely within the community at the moment um can everyone give a, a good virtual round of applause for anthony um fingers crossed we'll get to have another one of these in the future where we can actually get together and have a beer um i'm sure there'll definitely be it'll be a long night of questions for you <laughs> yeah I, I look forward to uh, to the opportunity so thanks a lot for uh, for letting me be here today